Hey everyone, uh, doing another weekly video here. Um, this one's on 1 Peter 4, 7, um, which talks about the end of all things being at hand. And I wrote this um, several years ago. This was written on February 3rd, 2015. Um, it's kind of interesting that this particular article, article comes up um, at a time when um, a lot of the world is thinking about end times events. A lot of a lot a lot of saints are thinking about um, end times with the with the current plague, um, the current uh, pandemic uh, of the coronavirus going on, and then you think about like the the locust swarms that are going on in Africa and the various earthquakes. Um, so a lot of Christians are looking at those events, pondering, thinking, you know, um, what does this all mean? Are these signs of the end times? And, and so that wasn't my thought going into this. It's just um, coincidental, um, you know, that by the sovereign hand of the Lord that this particular article comes up at this particular time. Um, I, I outlined the order of, of which I want to do these articles um, a long time ago, more than a year ago. So it just happens to be the time to do this one. And... Um, kind of... Um, little, I don't know, not unsettled, but unprepared. I, I, I didn't really prepare like I usually do um, to go through this article. I'll, I'll usually read through the article in the days leading up um, to doing the video. And so I, I can um, think about, you know, specific issues that I want to touch on or, or, or get my thoughts geared um, in a certain direction to try to line up, you know, perhaps where my thoughts were when I wrote this, the, the intent of writing the article and then and direct things that way. But I'm just kind of going to jump into this one without much forethought, not really sure where it's going to go. Um, as always, if you can't catch the whole thing or um, you can't watch it live, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch this and all my videos at your convenience. Um, I'm also doing a, a new series where I pray through the, the headline news of the day. Um, so if you want to check that one out too, you can see that on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's King Ram 417 and it's K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. And I try to get these posted as soon as I'm done going live so, so you can check it out um, on there at your convenience. Before getting into this article, I do want to pray. Um, so if you want to pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. I felt like I hastily came into this um, video without much forethought, without being prepared, without being spiritually prepared, without having my heart directed um, towards this endeavor, Lord, perhaps. Um, not feeling led to do this video today so i don't know if it's wise to do it lord I, I pray that you forgive me of that 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 you would bless this um anyways that you your word would go forth lord your word does not return void and so i pray that in spite of my my failures in spite of my faults um my disobedience lord that um, you would still use this video um to encourage other saints to to spur others on to to edify your body, to bring hope, to, to bring um, warning um, to anybody who doesn't know you, Lord. Uh, that you would use your word to, to uh, plant seeds in people's heart. That you would bring people to, to salvation. That you would uh, open their understanding, open their eyes. That you would grant them repentance and faith, Lord. Um, that you would humble me. That you would... I just feel unworthy doing this, Lord. I feel disobedient. I feel like um, you wanted me to postpone doing this, but I, 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 I don't know, out of some obligation, um, feeling that I needed to do it, Lord, because I've gotten in this habit of doing one a week, and I, I don't like missing out on doing them. Um, Will you please be in this anyways, Lord, and, and 
glorify your name in, in spite of my sin, that you would magnify yourself through this video. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, yeah, I guess what, what I'm talking about there in that prayer is like, um, so I, I've, I don't know, I got in the habit of doing these each week and I feel like sort of obligated to do it. And that's an impure motive because I feel like I, I'm, I'm doing it um, for the benefit uh, of others. And then there's pride in that. There's pride that says, oh, look at me, I've got this ministry, you know, so um that's the wrong motive usually i want to come into this spirit led like it's it's the right time you know like like the lord wants me uh to do this um so i i don't know if that makes any sense hopefully to the born again that that some of that will compute but um i do feel like the lord will bless this in spite of uh of my errors in spite of my sin um you know, we have the promise in his word that his word does not return void. And so I'm hopeful in that, that, that in spite of me, um, he'll, he'll still do something with this. So with all that said, I'm just going to jump into this here. Uh, again, this is on first Peter, um, chapter four, verse seven, uh, which reads, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Um, the end of all things is at hand. So the question that should immediately come to your mind, or at least says to mind, is how could Peter say that um, when since the time of Peter, life has continued um, for 2,000 plus years? Um, or, or about that, I'm, I'm not sure when Peter wrote First Peter, probably like 60 AD or somewhere around there. So almost 2,000 years. But he said in 60 AD that the end of all things was at hand. Um, so what is meant by that? If we're still here 2,000 years ago, there would seem to be an urgency. There would seem to be a imminence in that statement. And yet time has progressed for 2,000 years. And, and that's a question that has often perplexed me. Um, it's not just in Peter. Why do the scriptures um, so often use a phrase like that where it says that we are in the last days? Um, or, 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 you know, it, it, there's that imminence. There's that... Um, uh, ur urgency, that statement when it says in the last days and it's written, you know, in the first century AD, it seems like that's going to occur immediately. Um, so why are we still here 2000 years later? Well, I have a theory and that's kind of what I want to touch on with the main crux of this article. Um, and I've touched on it before in another video <clears throat> called the millennial Sabbath. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, you can, I'm looking at that one, and I, I don't know if I'm more detailed in this one or that, but they, they kind of go hand in hand. I just kind of branch off and do it to um, a uh, subtopic in this particular article. But um, the main point here is that God created everything in seven days. Um, we read about that in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and those are seven literal days that the Lord created everything, uh, seven 24-hour periods. And so my theory here is that I believe that the seven-day creation period was a foreshadow. It was a symbol and an example of Earth's history. Um, very often, God foreshadows things um, and, and uses analogies to help us understand. Um, for instance, the ten plagues um, that were poured out on Egypt are a foreshadow and an example of the plagues that come during the time of Revelation. Um, the sacrificial system that the Jews had uh, with the sacrificing of the lamb uh, was a, a physical example, a physical foreshadow of the sacrifice of Christ. <clears throat> uh, the Passover, when, when the Jews would, when the plagues were going on in Egypt and the Jews killed the lamb and, and spread the, the blood around the doorpost, uh, that was a physical example, a foreshadow uh, of God passing over us in uh, w with his wrath. It, it, he saved the Jews from, from the, the angel of destruction or the angel of death, I can't remember which it was, but um, with the blood of the lamb in the same way that the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, protects us from his wrath now. And we see examples of this type of foreshadowing all throughout the scriptures. Um, it's kind of a, a beautiful way uh, of how God 
um, unfolds history layer upon layer where you can look back and you can see um, the different the different systems, the different the different progresses, the different paths that the Lord used and how they're they're um, uh, exemplified in different ways, but in the, like the same substance, the same the same type of thing happens um again and so you see these patterns that the lord uses uh the old testament is full of that it's full of foreshadowing um uh, physical uh foreshadows of spiritual realities that that we experience as the new testament church um so with this theory with with that in mind i think with the seven day creation uh we also see a foreshadow you see the scriptures tell us that uh with god one day is like a thousand years. Uh, it says that in Second Peter three eight, it says, uh, "But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day." Um, now that particular verse is talking about the end times, and it's just talking about how the Lord is not um, slack in His coming saying that 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 time passing on is irrelevant to God it's it's as like a blink of an eye from the from the time of the crucifixion till now uh, cuz God exists outside of time um but the idea there is that um what if each day of creation each each of those one day 24 hour literal periods where God created the heavens and the earth what if each day was an example um, a, a foreshadow of a thousand year period of Earth's history, one day being like four or being like a thousand years. Um, that would mean that Earth's history is planned out for about a seven thousand year period. Uh, if you're tracking with me, and 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 this makes sense in the light of the fact that the seventh day uh, was the Sabbath, a day of rest. Uh, Genesis two. Verses 2 through 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. <clears throat> so, um, with the, the, the literal seventh day of creation being a Sabbath, a day of rest, and then when you tie that in with, with the fact that God also mentions a final 1,000-year period um, that we call the millennium, uh, he mentions that in the book of Revelation, uh, verse twenty or chapter 20, verse 6, uh, where it says, this is after the Lord has returned. It says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Um, so there's a thousand year period there at the end uh, called the millennium in which Christ rules and reigns on earth. And, and we will all enter a period of rest, a restored earth where, where there will be no more conflict. We're in this period of rest. So it, it ties in with the, the literal seventh day of creation being a day of Sabbath and the thousandth year, the thousand year final period of earth's history being a, a day of rest. So the question then becomes, how old is the earth? Well, if, if you do um, a genealogy study, if you add the genealogies, um, and, and the, the, the scriptures are very clear on this, very detailed on this, um, but you can take the genealogies from Adam to Noah, and then from from Noah to Moses, um, from Moses to David, and and David to Jesus, and then and then fast forward today. When you add up all those different genealogies, um, you get roughly six thousand years. Um, answers in Genesis, AIG.org, I think, um, has a, a good uh, article on that uh, called Bible genealogies. Um, one historian, uh, one Christian historian, puts Adam's birth um, in the year 4004 BC. Uh, whether or not that is exactly ex exactly accurate uh, can be debated. Um, I, I don't see scriptural evidence evidence for giving a direct specific date, uh, but the genealogies do add up um, to about six thousand years. Um, so that would mean that Adam was. Uh, somewhere around 4000 BC. Um, so whether or not that 4004 BC is, is exact, 
Um, we can debate that, but, but it's close enough. And for the point that I'm trying to make, that's what matters here in this discussion is that in general, it's a, it's a close date. So if we take this theory uh, of uh, the 1,000 year periods equaling one day, um, 4,004 BC through 3,004 BC uh, would be like one day in figure. Um, so then 3,004 to 2,004 BC would be day two, 2,004 BC to 1,004 BC would be like day three, 1,004 BC to 4 BC, which is when Jesus was born, uh, would be like day four. So now that puts us in the time of Jesus, Jesus being born it, roughly 4 BC. We don't have his exact date of his birth, but uh, most estimates and, 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 and it makes sense. Most reasoning, most logic, mo it makes sense that it was either, uh, four or five BC. So, so that brings us into the time of Jesus in the fourth day. And, and so that would explain why the scriptures written in the first century AD after that fourth day would say that we are in the last days. Four of seven have already passed. So we were, in fact, into those last days, those last thousand year periods. When the scriptures say that, uh, when Jesus would say it's the last days, or when Peter says we're in the last days, um, meaning that we've gone past the, the four days, the four thousand year periods, and now we're in the last three. Um, so then it, using that same chart, that same um, progression, 4000 BC to 996 AD, would be like day five in figure. And then 996 to 1996, which brings us into our current general time frame, would be like day six. So with all that said, we, we know that Christ's return that Christ's return in the clouds uh, with with power and majesty is the start of the millennium. It's the start of the seventh day. Uh, when Jesus comes, he brings in peace. We read about that in the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 20. Um, so, so Christ's return is the beginning of the seventh day. So now with the exact date of Adam uh, not being exactly known, not being known precisely, uh, we have a little wiggle room there um, to explain why Christ hasn't yet returned. Because if, 4, 004, if this was an exact science, 4004 to 1996 would be six days. So 1996 would have been the start of the seventh day. Uh, but nobody knows the time or the date. So date setters are frowned upon because uh, we can't know for, for certain. And that, that's why I think there's this, the, there's this vagueness. We don't know exactly when Adam was created. Um, we don't know exactly when Jesus was born. So, so these are, this isn't an exact science and this is all just theory. Um, but uh, we have that wiggle room there that would explain why the seventh day, the millennium, the thousand years of rest hasn't started yet. And we have um, the verse explaining that Christ is patient in his return, not wanting any to perish. Uh, that comes from Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Uh, which says, again, about the, the thousand year thing, and then continuing on, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some man, men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." Um, so, so the, uh, why has the Lord delayed his, his return? Because of lost souls, because there's lost sheep that need to be called into the kingdom. There's still a gospel that needs to be proclaimed. There, he, he's not going to lose one, so there's still some chosen remnant out there that need to be brought into the kingdom. Um, so, if uh, my theory here, if my theory of this, this seven-day creation being a foreshadow of the 7,000-year uh, periods of earth history, if that's accurate, and, and please keep in mind that this, this is not, I'm not talking, this isn't um, doctrine, this isn't dogma, this isn't something that I can point to a scripture and say, see, it says the thousand years uh, are represented by the seven days of creation. That's not what I'm saying. This is speculation. This is just something to ponder. This is something to think about. This is something to, to wonder, uh, to give um, 
extra urgency and, and, and excitement and joy to the prospect of us being in the last days of the last days, in the, in the very end of the end, like, like being uh, on the precipice of Christ's return. And, and so when you take all that in with, with studying prophecy, um, discerning world events, it, it seems like um, we are at the very end. Um, so we would truly be in the very last days of the last days. Um, uh, again, on the precipice of Christ's return and the start of the Sabbath millennium. So we had better uh, give heed um, to, the, to this verse in 1 Peter 4, 7 and give it our utmost attention. Um, so let's look at it again closely. It says that because the end of all things is at hand, we ought to be sober and watch unto prayer. So to be sober is, is not talking alcohol. It's, it's being sober-minded, to be serious, um, to, 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 to not be foolhardy and, and, and um, just mad in our thinking, going about like, like everything's okay. It's to be serious, to be focused. To understand that we are in the last days, we need to take things seriously, to be on guard, to be cautious, um, not caught up in frivolousness and carelessness and the, and the cares of this world, um, but to be like a soldier on watch, knowing that an attack is coming at any moment. Um, just like that soldier, we too are to be on high alert. Um, now, it caution with that. It's not fear. It's not fear-based. Uh, the Christian is courageous because we're more than conquerors. There is no fear. Whether we live or die, it's, 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 you know, to die is gain. There is no, there's no fear in death anymore. The, the sting of death has been removed. So we're not fearful. Um, that, that's not what being on alert is about. It's, it's being ready, um, being, being ready to jump into action. I heard one pastor say like, um, I don't know if it was Piper or Washer, uh, one of the two, uh, I think, was talking about how like a soldier on guard, um, a soldier stationed outside his fort on high alert, um, he's attentive to everything, to all of his surroundings. He feels the wind. Um, he, he hears a stick break and he's ready to pounce on it. You know, and so that's how we're supposed to be looking at world events, um, considering our life, looking at lost souls going about. We're supposed to be on high alert, high alert, thinking, you know, the Lord could come. the The end of all things is at hand. Uh, so we are to be serious, to be sober. Uh, the King is coming, and His judgment is coming with Him. Um, so the other thing this verse talks about is, is to watch unto prayer. So what does that mean? What does it mean to watch? Um, well, in the garden uh, of Gethsemane, Gethsemane uh, Jesus asked his disciples to watch with him, and then he started to pray. So that makes sense. To, to watch is to be prayerful. Um, again, there's an alertness, there's a caution, there's an on guard. And, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It's a spiritual war that we're in. We're not fighting against lost people. We're fighting against the, the, the overarching ideologies driving them, the, the principalities, the powers that direct them and control them and blind them. And that is fought in the spirit world. That is fought spiritually, not physically. Um, so, and that's done through prayer, um, to be in communication with the father at all time as a battle, um, using that soldier scenario as a battle is getting nearer, what better way, uh, to remain safe than to remain in communication with the battle commander, um, to, to, to get your instructions from on high. And we see that in, in all the wartime movies and every soldier, I'm not a soldier, but I'm sure soldiers out there know that um, you want to get that communication to get the intel um, so that you know where to go and, and where to direct your fight. And so that's how we, we're, we're to be serious, sober-minded, uh, focused and on alert and in watchful and constant prayer with the Lord. Lord, what is it you would have me to do? Where Where is this to, battle to be fought? What should I be praying about? Who should I be speaking to about you? Uh, what means do I have to go into battle? Um, so the bottom line, um, it, it, and, and, and this this article here is, is pretty short, so I'll, I'll be wrapping up here in a minute, but the bottom line is that the king is coming soon. 
Um, whether my theory is correct or not, if Peter said we were in the end days 2,000 years ago, then we're that much closer to the end days today. And, and when we look around at the signs of the times, um, not just with the plagues, not just with the famines, not with just the earthquakes, not with just the, the nations against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, what Jesus told us about, uh, but also just discerning world events, how um, world leaders everywhere on a, on a geopolitical sp sphere are, are directing things towards one world government. Um, that, and that's prophesied in the book of Revelation that all nations, tribes, and tongues will worship the beast. There's a, there's a collective a unity of the world in the last days. And we see our world leaders talking about this. We see that with our own eyes and our own time. Um, you know, and, and I would say that we're even at the end of that because that started like at World War II with the, the, the creation of the UN. Um, and the reformation of Israel and, and, and just this direction um, towards one world government. Then you add to that, you look at things like the way technology is increasing, which Daniel talked about in, the, in chapter 12, about how he was to seal up the vision of the prophecy until the end. And then at the end, it mentions two things that would occur at the end, uh, the increase of travel and the increase of knowledge. And it's just within our generation, like within this last hundred years or so where where knowledge and travel have skyrocketed where where things progress throughout all of human history on a on a pretty plateaued field a pretty even uh keel their travel was by horseback or boat you know from from the time of adam till the time of jesus till the 1800s um and then all of a sudden we had engines we had uh we had uh, just at the turn of the century the the in the, in the 1900s airplanes rockets you know all of a sudden travel to and fro you can travel the world in a day um so that just happened is it coincidental that that happened at about the same time that the world started talking about one world government that we started seeing an increase in earthquakes increase in famines increase in pestilence that we saw world wars nation against nation all these things kind of came to be um, at about the same time um, and so if that was occurring in the early 1900s 1940s or whatever technology took off right about then too um, up until then people were pretty illiterate uh, people had newspapers after the start of the printing press and books knowledge increased a little bit then uh, but it was only after the uh, invention of radio, the invention of television, invention of computers, uh, microchips, all of a sudden technology took off right around that same time too. And so then you look at that and then you look at where that technology is going and how the talk is about um, the internet of things and how they want to have everything tracked. And they're talking about implantable microchips. And the book of Revelation talks about that in the same chapter where it talks about this world unity. It talks about everybody having a mark to buy or sell. That is occurring in our day and time. We're seeing that progress. Um, so regardless of whether or not my theory about the seventh day Sabbath um, is correct, I would say using discernment, watching and being sober-minded, discerning events would tell us we're on the precipice. Now, does that mean that it, it could be another 100 years or so? Sure, the Lord could delay his return because he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. We don't know how many of the elect are out there that haven't been saved yet. God knows that. And so his timing is his secret counsel. But uh, the Lord told us the same way we can look at a tree and tell when it's about to bloom, when, when it's about to come into season. Um, we can tell by looking at the world and saying, man, it sure does look like we're coming into an end time season. It sure does look like things are 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 progressing to this. Um, so I would say that we're in the end here. But um, the Lord is coming. Vengeance is coming with Him. Now, as saints, we're not going to face the wrath of God. First uh, Thessalonians five nine says, "For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ." Our debt has been paid on the cross, so we are not under the wrath of God. Um, but we will face persecution. We will face the wrath of the world um, and, and, and the wrath of its, its king, this world's king, the devil, Satan. Um, we learn about that uh, in 2 Timothy 3.12, where it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
and also in Revelation 13, 7, um, same chapter where it talks about the, the unifying of the world and the mark of the beast. It says, and it was it, 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 talking about the beast here. Um, it says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Uh, goes on to talk about here is the patience of the saints. Talks about if we defend ourselves, if we take up arms, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Those who take into captivity will be taken into captivity. That's not the path of the saint. We are to patiently endure, to love our enemies, to pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Um, ours is a spiritual war, not a physical war. They're going to attack us physically, but we're fighting back spiritually in prayer and compassion and pity and service and loving one another and loving the lost and, and preaching the gospel. That is how we do battle. Um, so we're not going to face the wrath of God, but we are going to face the persecution of the world. If we truly are in these end times, um, we're going to, it says that Satan is going to overcome us, um, which means that, you know, persecution is going to be severe. We're going to, I would assume most of us are going to die um, but that's okay. We're not supposed to love our lives unto the death. We're supposed to give ourselves to this, um, to the service of others, to, to, to seeking and saving the lost. Um, so they can do no damage to God uh, when this world system, the devil and his kingdom, they, they can't attack God, so they're going to turn against us. Um, now, again, this is not to be feared. Uh, Luke 12, 4 tells us that... Um, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. After that, all they can do is kill us. There's an after that. After they kill us, we're in glory. So there's no harm they can really do to us. Um, it goes on to say in, 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 um, in verse 5 here, um, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's where our fear is, in, in the reverent fear of God. And, and the fear for others, as we look upon others, it, that's why martyrs were able to preach um, to those that were killing them, even as they're burning in the fire, because they had compassion and pity for these poor lost people. All they were doing was dying and then going to glory. But these people were going to die and then face the wrath of God. And, and so that is what, what, what drove the martyrs to preach on their deathbeds, and it's what should spur us on and drive us. Um, so we're not to be afraid of what people can do to our bodies, but we are to be prepared. Prepare your hearts. Be ready for these things. Jesus told us these things in advance so that they would not catch us off guard. Uh, Matthew 24, 25. Matthew 24 is the chapter where Jesus is talking about the end times. And at the end of it, he says in verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. That preparation to be prepared, to have our minds set on it. Um, there's an old saying for, for anybody who's been locked up in prison or jail that, that you, you hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Um, and that's that mindset. We are prepared to suffer. We can't let this world ensnare us where we're so caught up in our creature comforts. We're so caught up in materialism that we're afraid to lose those things and that we sacrifice our faith. We sacrifice our bold witness in order to hold on to these materialistic things. We can't think, oh, I need all these things, so I better not go talk about Jesus. I, I better not uh, have the world hate me and take these things from me. Um, the Lord has has told us beforehand, be prepared. You are going to be hated. You are going to be persecuted. Whether we're in the last days or not, uh, darkness hates the light. Um, we have to count the cost. Um, so when we fully understand that persecution brings purification, that the persecution of the world strips us of, of our worldly loves, and, and, and so it's for our betterment, persecution is a glorious thing. It causes us, we have so many comforts. Like I, I look around my life and I think, man, I got so many things, so much, so much, you know, time consuming things that I cling to all these comforts. Um, and, and I can't seem to get rid of them. I seem to, my flesh is hooked on them. Persecution purifies 
persecution causes us to re to release these things. Um, so when we understand that, we can rejoice in our hardships, knowing that they produce the character of Christ in us. Um, there's numerous verses that talk about that. I, I'm going to look at three here. Uh, 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter, or first, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Let me pause there. I've often thought persecution is a beautiful um, indicator of faith. Like a lot of times early on in my faith, you know, wrestling with doubts. Am I really saved? Am I not? The thought, man, if, if I'm persecuted for my faith, that's an evidence of the reality of my faith. The persecution is an evidence and that, that rejoices the heart. It's, it's the spirit of glory is upon you. Otherwise, the world wouldn't hate you. Um, picking up in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Um, meaning that if you suffer for those things, you deserve it. Uh, pick, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him and well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Um, in the book of James, chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There's a purifying process in persecution, in hardships. And then uh, Philippians 1, uh, verse 29, it says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Um. So with that in mind, we can lift our heads in excited anticipation as we are about to see the return of the king. End times events, um, seeing these signs, um, being uh, aware and alert, being sober-minded and watchful and seeing these things should never um, produce fear in the born-again Christian. It ought to create excitement and rejoicing and hope knowing that the day of the king is drawing near. And it also ought to produce an urgency and a compassion and a love to reach out to the lost for time is drawing short for them. The, there, there's a time coming where they will no longer hear the gospel, where the time of repentance is done. And so it, it, it ought to create this, this urgency and this hopeful anticipation in us. Um, I did a series of videos a while back um, on the end times. Uh, it's on my YouTube channel. It's called the end. It's just a, 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 a video series called end times. It's divided into three uh, short parts. Um, I'd recommend you go watch those. I'll, I'll try to, or I'm sorry, it's in, uh, it's actually in six parts, not, not three parts. Um, I'll try to link those, um, when I, when I post this on, on YouTube. Um, but that's what I got. Uh, so if you're just catching the end of this, you didn't get to watch the whole thing. Um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can watch this and all of my videos at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram 417. That's K, my middle initial Ingram, my last name 417. And I should have this posted, uh, Lord willing, here shortly. All right. I love you guys. Talk to you later.